It's going. It's been a um, very interesting day. We're in transition. Like I said, I'm moving from Natick, Mass to um, Cambridge and doing some follow-up with my dad who had an aortic valve done on April 1st. So very grateful and thankful. What type of medicine are you specializing in? I am a primary care physician, a family okay. doctor. And after I finished my family medicine training, I did my second life, as I call it, in occupational environmental medicine. And I specialized in heavy metals. Okay. And occupational environmental medicine is a subspecialty of preventative health, preventative medicine. And I'm also a medical review officer. And the proudest thing I'm proud to say today is that I'm a certified cannabinoid medicine specialist. Really? What kind of process did you have to go through for that one? I saw 2,000 patients. I had started to write recommendations in the state of uh, Washington. Uh -huh. And in July, I'm coming up on my anniversary here in eight, uh, for eight years. There you go. And after I had seen 2,000 patients, uh, it was a prerequisite to be able to take the exam through the American Academy of Cannabinoid Medicine. And I had completed the 2,000 patients. And in May of 2014, I had gotten certified. There, were, there probably wasn't a whole lot of doctors doing that at the time. There was not a lot. And there really was not um, a lot of protection for us. When I first started in 2012, and Obama's rules and you know ability to protect doctors did not come about till much later. So with everything that's going on with the coronavirus and everything, you're up in the New England area. Have you seen an increase, decrease? I mean, there's a lot of different stuff going on around the media about hospitals are empty, hospitals are full, nobody knows what's going on. How, how are you guys being affected up there? You know, I'm really not sure to tell you the God's honest truth because I'm in my own little world and <laughs> I am, um, you know, seeing patients through telehealth. And what I'm hearing is there's patients that have tested positive, not as many as I expected, uh -huh. you know, very few to tell you the truth. And people have had symptoms of retrospectively saying, I think I had the virus, but really not confirmatory. And also the people that have been hospitalized have gotten very sick that have been um, put on respirators. And we're hearing numbers, there's still a flux so we really don't know the accuracy is what I feel right now of the total scope of the impact on the virus. So what's your perspective on it? Do you think it's going to increase now that everybody's getting released back into the wild? I think what's going to happen is we are going to learn that there is definitely a resistance factor. There is a hygiene factor. There's also a genetic factor that I feel that's going to be very uh, important that we start looking at because viruses have always fascinated me uh -huh. you know going back to even um, looking at hepatitis or herpes or HIV and how we know that we talk about transmissibility between partners and how couples you know they're intimate and yet one person has hepatitis and the other person never gets it Right. Or one person has HIV and the other person never gets it, or herpes for that fact. So I'm very curious as to see if this virus is going to have a component where people, nutrition is going to have a factor, people that have received vaccines, combination of vaccines, you know, how many years of vaccines have you received and which years just did you receive it? Because when people receive the flu vaccine, they're getting some form of a treatment to avoid certain types of viruses. Right. And it's a guesstimation. Vaccines are based on what we know from history. Okay. So I'm very curious to see how many people that actually got the virus got the flu vaccine. How many people got the virus that didn't get the flu vaccine? Did they get it this year? Did they get it in every year? Did they get it regularly? And also to look at nutrition. And as a provider that is recommending cannabis, I would love to see the numbers to see how many patients that are cannabis users did not get the virus. That would be an interesting statistic for sure. Very, very interesting.
and also the people that died if they were positive for cannabis use. Interesting. So with the cannabinoids, um, you know, helping with the immune system, uh, it kind of goes into your question or your curiosity as to if the cannabinoids or cannabis or CBD, whatever, is going to help the immune system. And do you think that this will actually help advance the political hurdles for cannabis so that you guys can research it? I hope so. I really hope so, Lance. You know, in Massachusetts, uh, they have considered cannabis as essential, uh -huh. but they took away the adult use. Some states made both available, both the medical and the adult use available. And I would love to see the impact again, retrospectively, to say which states had cannabis available, which states did not have it available for medical use. How many states that had the adult use kept it open? And did that impact the people getting the virus down the road? Because when you talk about immunity and resistance, I really believe that one's immune system has a big role in whether we're impacted by this illness and to what effect that you will have. Is it going to be mild, moderate, or severe? And we know most people have had some mild forms of it, but again, um, we can't confirm and say definitely everybody that's had it is testing positive. And the ones that have had it, are they getting antibody testing? And if they test positive, is that giving them a confidence to think that they're not going to get it again and then they're not taking the proper precautions? It's sort of like the domino effect, you know? Right. Where do you stop? Uh, and yet, I really believe in prevention. That uh -huh. is something that I've really dedicated my life to even before I got into the cannabis world by understanding that preventative health is not taught and understood. So do you think that that type of information um, would Big Pharma want to, you know, get released to the public? Or, you know, do you think that type of information would be censored based on just the fact that cannabis is kind of taking their market share? There's still a bit of censorship, but I think people are overcoming all of that because Noam Chomsky said it a long time ago, <laughs> You know, drugs are FDA approved, cannabis is people approved. And I really remember that to understanding that that's what's really making the difference. It's not the medical community that's coming out and supporting this plan. It's the people. Mm -hmm. And the people are the ones that are trying to teach their healthcare providers. And I've made this statement, all patients are not doctors but yet all doctors are patients. Hmm. And at some point, we have to understand that life is finite. You know, we, we are born and we're gonna die. And what are the things are people gonna die from? And can we avoid that they're gonna die from a complication of a virus that we can maybe prevent? So since coronavirus, I mean, it's a virus and HIV doesn't have a vaccine, Herpes doesn't have a vaccine. Do you really think there's this big push for vaccines? What are we really talking about here? Is That's it, is a very good question. What <laughs> are we talking about here? You know, what are we trying to say here to people? Everybody needs to go get vaccinated. And being that you get vaccinated, what is those implications? Right. Because, you know, I'm also an occupational environmental medicine physician. And things that I've looked at is that, who are the people that get vaccinated? Where are we getting them vaccinated, right? We've started to look at people get vaccinated in their deltoid muscles. They get vaccinated in their gluteal muscles. And this is where we're starting to see all these replacements of these joints, right? Is there a relationship of long-term effects of these injections you know, to that area, predisposing joint damage? And how many vaccines should a person be getting? Is, right. there, is there a moment in time uh, that we say, you know, enough is enough? Or we, what we have to say is that, well, you know, you've gotten all of those vaccines. Could there be a contraindication to you getting another vaccine? Or how many times? How often? You know, I, and I'm just going off from my curiosity as an individual and then my curiosity as a clinician 
And then my curiosity as to how am I going to be able to speak truth to my patients? And I don't know if you've seen the movie out there, but it, uh, it's called Vaxxed. Uh, I think Robert De Niro was a producer in it or a director of some kind. Um, I saw it. Um, my ex-wife was a big believer in not vaccinating our children, so we haven't vaccinated them. Just because there's the risk factors in it, the heavy metals, where it comes from, you know, the amount that they need, uh, you know, them running MMR all into one, and then the autism spike. It's 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 insane it, when you really kind of get down to it. It's but it, it's almost like like we said, there's a lot of censorship that's going on right now because. The vaccine companies, Bill Gates, they don't want that information to get out because they're the ones profiting from it. So with them pushing a vaccine so so hard, and then now there's this random outbreak of a children's virus or a children's uh, illness that they don't even know what it is. You know, I, I saw, granted, I saw it on Facebook, take it with a grain of salt, right? I saw a video, there was a news report, a news lady talking outside of a, a hospital. It looked fake. It really did. You know, it looked like she was, she was lit different. The background image wasn't the same clarity. It was obviously, it seemed very fake. With that being said, they go into, there's a, like multiple cases of these children coming down with this random illness. They called it a random illness or an unknown illness that they have no idea. And it's kind of funny when you put this together, it's like, okay, coronavirus happened so fast. It hit the entire world. And then now they're letting people back in but they don't want to let people back in certain sides of the parties. And now they're attacking the kids because the adults are the ones thinking with their minds and, you know, the vaccines, they might not be the best option, but if they attack the kids, they could be forcing them to think, Oh, I need to vaccinate my child. So they still have an out to get a vaccine to the children because they possibly won't let them back to school or into daycare without it. It's exactly, it's That's crazy. Where, you know, I know of a doctor in California and he did not want to vaccinate his twins. And they are now planning to leave the state because of guidelines, you know, wow. where this is where these are real issues that people have to face. And, you know, as a clinician, we talk about this thing called herd immunity. And uh, herd immunity is about if we vaccinate 80% of the population, the other 20% will be protected because the other the 80% have been vaccinated and therefore those people will not get it and therefore there will be not the spread of the illness. Now, with the coronavirus, the concern is how it's contagious and because it can last so much longer. But again, my thing is some of the basics that I said in 2006, what are certain things that we should be doing globally? What are the things for health? What are the things for hygiene? And in 2006, when I created Global Health and Hygiene Solutions, my mission has been to promote wellness and prevent illness. That's the foundation of where I believe on a global level that we can prevent things and we could definitely promote wellness. We can. And if it's here or in, in India or anywhere else, we're understanding for the first time that this virus has actually brought the whole world together. To a certain extent, you're right. I, yeah, I believe that 100% because it's not just one country or one political party or one you know faction of a country that has that ideology or has been impacted that you know that way. Now everybody's going through it. it it's you're, you're exactly right, and it's pretty fascinating. Also, it's scary to see how this is unfolding because a lot of governments across the board are really kind of in line with it all but some people think it's a hoax some people think that you know stay at home you know this this and this i mean we could go on and on play devil's advocate i could probably go down a rabbit hole to talk about you know the conspiracy theories and you know where i see this thing going but anyways let's digress it's digress, but i think you come to a point about what is a commonality and the commonality is that we're not uh, invincible and no matter who you are where you are you can be impacted in some way or know somebody that's been impacted by this in in a very um, personal way and what I look at it is I'm always the optimist I look at this as an amazing opportunity because what I've seen with my patients 
uh, is patients are happy as a clam, to tell you the truth. They are right now in a very comfortable part of their life. And, you know, mental health is something that's out there all over the world. Fear is something that's all over the world. Anxiety is all over the world. And the thing about death and giving birth are, are realities. Okay. So when you understand that this is the scope of what we're dealing with, what can we do? Right. What can we share? What can we make a difference? And the truth of the fact is understanding what we're putting in our bodies, what we're putting around us, because this novel virus is a mutation of a virus. Okay. Viruses were created from either through birds, through animals, either be a pig, be it this other new animal, whatever it is, there's a vector, as we call. There's something that went through something else that changed it now that got it spread to everybody else. Right. So most of these things, when you look at it, it's because people were confined. And in these cases, it was the animals were confined. Interesting. Right? When you look at birds or with H1N1, beef contamination, all of these things was because this was a man-made creation, right? This is something that we created in our society in this time and age. And we will continue to do this, is what the other reality of it is. We've had viruses, 1720, 1829, whatever it may be, there's going to be other viruses. So let's just prepare. So getting ourselves mentally, emotionally, and physically prepared is how we have to cope with this. And so right now we are being physically separated from people. But it does not mean you can't get outside and get some sunlight. Right. It does not mean you can't pick up the phone and call a few people. It does not mean you can't do other things like prepare healthy meals. People have been saying to me, I've lost weight, Dr. Uma, because I'm not going out and eating junk food. I'm consciously mindful of what foods I've brought into my home, how many people are there now, and some people have multiple generations all of a sudden in their home. <laughs> you know, grandparents got their kids and their kids and their grandkids. You know, so this is changing people. Mm -hmm. it's, it's saying that, well, how quickly can you adapt to things? Right? And I feel it's also made people understand that there's been more divorces. People would say, realize I can't do this anymore or I've got to make a change about it. So it does give an opportunity, again, to reevaluate a mm -hmm. lot of things. We've reevaluated how we conduct medicine. We've reevaluated how many times do you need to really uh, go outside and how we conduct business. You see people, now there's one, I see one-way roads on one-way pathways in the stores. So <laughs> yeah. again, you know, these are things that have come up and maybe they, some of them will stay. Some of them will go away. But we've had more delivery options, more people becoming creative in how they, they can be able to communicate with people. Zoom, all of these visual things that have been able to uh, have as a tool for people. And people have actually been reaching out to people more and talking to their grandkids <laughs> and seeing that face to face because they're not able to travel to go be with them. And, and you're right, it is sad and it is scary, but I feel we can bind together and make it better. I think you're exactly right. There is a silver lining to all of this. Like you said, families are getting closer um, or people are realizing, you know, that they need to make a change and it's their life. They have to prioritize what's important to them. Um, you know, it is unfortunate that, you know, the, there are children out there and families that, you know, have to be with a certain individual that is not probably the best suiting person for that situation, uh, you know, probably more so because they have to be stuck at home with them. Um, but anyways, speaking of not going anywhere and the changes in medicine, I was extremely fascinated to hear that cannabis was deemed essential in yes. it, with all of the fight that everybody's done for the last 40 years, 50 years, all of a sudden, 
hey, we need it. What, I mean, <laughs> like it's a great thing for the cannabis industry and it's a great thing for the medical industry too because it's really, it's shown the demand for something even over food, a restaurant closed down. That, that blows my mind. What's your take on all of that? Well, I'm glad you brought that up because when they decided to keep the liquor stores open and shut down the adult use cannabis stores, that to me was a hooray to show that alcohol is addictive, cannabis is not. I've said this as part of why I look at these two things. Alcohol is legal. Cannabis is still federally illegal, but they're able to say alcohol stores have to be open because if you took away somebody's alcohol abruptly like that, they're going to go through withdrawals and withdrawals from alcohol can lead to death. Withdrawals from cannabis are not going to lead you to death. <laughs> yeah. And I, I'm standing here as a, as a witness. I was sober. Oh, I am sober now. Um, it's been off and on for two years, but uh, you know, I had a little hiccup here and there, but you know, now it's been over, over six months of sobriety and you know, that's adding on to the two years before that I'm done with it. You know, I quit it cold Turkey both times. Um, you know, I'm probably one of the rare instances that, you know, that is, uh, a possibility or, you know, maybe possibly the phenomenon, but not trying to pat myself on the shoulder because that alcohol is a grip and it's, it's not easy for anybody to break. And I mean, I know it, I've been through it twice. And so it, it's good to see that that has been brought to the forefront because people need their vices, you know, people have vices. And when they're in quarantine, they need that mind altering substance, whether it's caffeine, uh, tobacco, uh, you know, alcohol or cannabis, you know, to kind of get away from reality because reality sucks. You know, sometimes reality really does suck when you turn on the TV, you, really, you think about your problems or, you know, it's great, you know, depending on your perspective on life. So um, with that being said, now that cannabis has been deemed essential, how fast do you think that that's going to push the decriminalization? But I'm actually looking for it to be descheduled from a medical perspective because I really feel that um, descheduling it on a federal level from that aspect of it is going to make it that it will make people understand to be able to do the research and then they could give the data that they want. So then, then it's not considered this is part of a criminal activity because that's where this, all of these things stem from. They made it look like cannabis caused murder, insanity, and death. That's what made cannabis go into prohibition. That's why it stays in prohibition because there's still that misinformation that was given by Harry Anslinger and the people that supported him, which are the Hearst, the DuPonts, the Rockefeller, the Carnegie's and the Mellons, because they had their agenda. And so you started out by talking about pharmaceutical companies. And this is how I look at it. There's synthetic and then there's what's produced on this earth. And there's going to be lots and lots of synthetic things that we create in this world. And what we're realizing is that part of these synthetic things is what's causing our bodies to create cancers. And now that we can start talking about cannabis as an option, and I would love to have more Dr. Umas out there to show, <laughs> listen, seriously, that this is a livelihood that I can support by saying, I haven't written an opioid in a decade. I don't take a dime from the government. And I've given my patients a, a legal option in the states that I can. And I have gotten patients off of their opioids and medications and alcohol and nicotine, and more so improve their quality of life. I mean, this is not just something that's not reproducible. So. If we can get the medical community to first learn that we have a endocannabinoid system, <laughs> that's a starting point on a medical level, on a worldwide level. People know we have a digestive system. We know you got to pee, you got to poop. <laughs> you, you, if those don't work, you've got a problem. Right. And hopefully, sexual activity is part of life as well. So. You know, these are the things that I ask my patients. Are you peeing? Are you pooping? Are you sexually active? How's your sleep? 
What's your activity level? This is quality of life. And if we can make this option available all over and have it be tested possibly to make sure, like you mentioned, the heavy metals, the contaminations that we know we don't need in our body because the presence of those can harm us, not just now, in the long term. And we're talking about cannabis being given to all ages. You know, we've got babies, we've got young kids, we've got the seniors, we've got the elderly, we've got pregnant women, we've got all facets of one's life that are using this plant. So my concerns and my diligence is my mission. I want the stigma change regarding cannabis. I want the world to know about the endocannabinoid system. And I do it through education. And as we all learn about it, the more resources that we have, which can then take everybody's control of their own health. And that's where this is going to change. Healthcare systems are going to be there, but the individual is going to have to start taking responsibility and not rely on their doctor. So in your studies and in your, your experience, um, what kind of ratios are you kind of seeing being the most effective, the widest, uh, the, the most widely uh, acceptable or usable ratios in, in your practice? So again, these are some of the things that I've developed over the years. And I have three basic rules, Dr. Uma says to our patients, because we have patients that have never ever used cannabis, patients that are self-medicating and patients that used it years ago and are now coming back to using cannabis. Right. So the three basic rules we have is you got to got to hydrate before you medicate. Because the side effect of cannabis is dehydration. And if people are not hydrated when they use cannabis, it's a setup for failure. Because most people are not hydrated to begin with anyway. Right. That's what makes them very anxious. And it sets up for other complications of illnesses. Huh. So you've got to, got to hydrate before you medicate. The second rule is we know that when you use cannabis, your blood sugar drops. That's why you can get a little angsty, a little hungry, angry. So always have food on board when you use cannabis. And then the third rule I tell people is journal, write it down. Okay. Because if you don't write it down, you have no freaking clue how it affects you. Right. You have no idea what you're getting. It's not that you can say, I have this many milligrams in my pill because that's what a synthetic drug is. A synthetic drug is the same every time. But the plant can vary. The top of the plant is different than the middle or the bottom if you're looking at flowers. Right. If you make a batter and you make a batter with cookies and chips in it, every cookie does not have the same number of chips in it. Every mm. bite does not have the same number of chips in it. So you, you understand that. So this is educating people that the plant cannabis mm -hmm. has over a thousand different chemicals in it. It has flavonoids. It has terpenoids, it has fatty acids, and the cannabinoids that we've learned about, THC, well studied, CBD, well studied, but there's a whole slew of them in between now. We have over 140 different cannabinoids that we've learned about. So when we talk about ratios, we have to look at what ratios are we talking about? Is it CBD to THC? Is it CBD to CBG, CBN? What are the ratios? Right. And what is the source of this? Because cannabis is in the family of cannabisia. The species, this, uh, the genus is cannabis sativa, and there's three species cannabis sativa, cannabis indica, and cannabis ruralis. Mm -hmm. Within these, we then human, man made, distinction between hemp and marijuana <laughs> right yeah because it's all cannabis sativa yep yeah if it's less than 0.3 percent thc we call it hemp 
If it's greater than 0.3% THC, we call it marijuana. So this is the guidelines of what we talk about. So when we talk about ratios, you have to look and say, is this from a hemp or is it from marijuana? So I guess a better question would be, which ratio are you using more of? Is it, since there are so many new cannabinoids, or is, that, is there one that's really piquing your guys' interest or are, is the uh, mainstream uh, medical practicing still focused on CBD and THC? We start there. Some uh -huh. people don't even want to go to THC. They'll right. just start with the CBD. They'll start with just the whole plant extract from CBD, which has less than the 0.3% of THC. So that way they start to feel a little level of comfort that, oh, I'm taking this, I'm getting some good effects and I'm not having any type of mental effects or that I don't like to use the word psychoactive. I call it, you know, the intoxicating effects. Okay. So if you haven't eaten, you know how you feel. Your blood sugar is low, right? And if you've eaten too much, you know how you feel. If somebody's had one drink, have had two drinks or more, how they feel. So if you haven't slept, that's a form of intoxication, the way I look at it, because you should not be operating a, a vehicle because you're impaired, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about then using these ratios, this is where once we get somebody on CBD, we could start them in maybe in a one-to-one -one ratio or even a higher percentage of CBD, 20% CBD to 1% THC and have them kind of titrate is the word I use. One drop, five drops, 10 drops. See what, or start with five drops and go up and down. So there's a starting point and understanding that there is no one cookie cutter for everybody. Right. The lance that wakes up is not the same lance that needs to go to bed. Right? Yeah. When you need to go to bed, you want to go to sleep. You don't want to be out there ready to start your day over again. So there's an appropriateness of what you need at different times of the day. That's one issue. Then there might be patients that have anxiety. Their anxiety is worse when they're ready to get out of their home. So I have patients that will medicate right before they get in the car. And they're not impaired because they know how they feel. And this is where everybody's different. We are not promoting anybody to do anything harmful. Safety first, do no harm. So with that being said, and your patients are medicating outside of their home, um, pretty much standard across the country is you can only medicate, you know, personal confinement, uh, you know, inside your house, your personal space, et cetera. Um, you know, they're starting to become more lax on that, you know, with students that have to go to school, et cetera. But now there's that new breathalyzer and whatnot that's coming out for THC that could possibly get patients, you know, caught up in, in a legal matter. So what do you think is the way forward with that? Say a patient needs to have a tincture or they need to smoke some flour while they're out and about and they have to drive a vehicle. If you're impaired, you're impaired. Right. That's how I look at it. Okay. So a test is not to me impairment. And this is where, again, if they understood what the endocannabinoid system is, because I'm also a medical review officer, so I can speak about this boldly. There are patients that pee in a cup and they test positive for some THC. That does not mean they're impaired. Right. They could have used it 30 days ago. And depending on man, women, frequency, body mass, fat composition, it can stay in your system longer or shorter. So to make these judgment calls and having breathalyzers, because a breathalyzer for alcohol, alcohol metabolism is way different than cannabis metabolism. And there's a clear cut definition. You could say, you know, one drink, one hour, two drinks, what the metab, and that too can vary from individual to individual. Somebody that drinks, might not be impaired to driving. So this is where education, getting the right information, being able to do some of these research studies, because what they've really shown is people sometimes will drive better if they <laughs> use cannabis versus if they haven't used cannabis. Right. Okay. So it really depends on the individual and how they use it and 
how they are comfortable using it. And this is why low and slow, titrate, these are the words in journaling because I am here to educate somebody how to use it appropriately. We have no problem with a patient on 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 pills a day. Not a bat of an eye. Mm -hmm. Not a bat of an eye. And those people are impaired. And they're operating vehicles. But not a bat of an eye to say that that's not right or wrong. And that's where I tell people, if you are impaired, you are impaired. Do not do anything that could cause you to cause harm to yourself or anybody else. And so to answer your question, I feel people need to be able to use their medicines appropriately where they need it. If you were asthmatic and you were told you can't use your inhaler in public and you're having an attack, is that appropriate? Huh. I'm glad that you clarified that because the, a lot of this stuff, like you said, it's education. It needs to get out there. And so I like to ask these open-ended questions, or, you know, kind of the informatory questions for the listeners out there so that they become aware if they don't know, because in the, in the course of the evolution, if you will, of cannabis and hemp, as soon as it became legal uh, for on the recreational level or the adult use level, you know, law enforcement was kind of scrambling. How are we going to catch these guys? How are we going to catch them? And like you said, it's mostly an impaired thing. It's not necessarily um, you know, the use because of the metabolism, et cetera. And that was one thing that I tried to tell a lot of people, you know, it's going to stay up in your system, depending on your, your, uh, your, in, the individual, you know, yourself, your body mass, you know, like you said, metabolism, how frequently the dose from anywhere between 24 hours to like three months to, it, it depends, you know? It and depends. so you can't, you can't just catch somebody on the side of the road and say, all right, you just popped hot for marijuana. It's like, well, I mean, I'm fine. It's, yeah, it's interesting to see how the turn of events and the evolution, like you said, it's like legal, it was fight legal or illegal, fighting for it, activism, legal, medical, adult use, law enforcement comes in, coronavirus necessity. Nobody saw this coming for cannabis. <laughs> well, see, this is another thing that you bring up about drug testing. And as a medical review officer, there's two types of drug tests. There's federal drug testing and non-federal drug testing. And if you work for a federal entity and you fall in those guidelines for federal testing, you're screwed mm -hmm. because um, if they randomly do a test on you, and even if you didn't use it while you were at work, you're going to test positive. So that means you can't use it at all. But it's okay to be on your three different blood pressure medications, five different medications for your mental health two meds because you can't pee and one for because you can't poop, you know, one because your penis doesn't work, whatever it may be, <laughs> that's okay. You know, I'm being blunt in saying certain things, but that's the reality. You know, the party pack of five is what I called it. Blood pressure, diabetes, cholesterol, something for reflux, something for anxiety or depression. This is what I saw day in and day out, day in and day out, year after year after year. And there was no exit plan. There is no exit plan. When are we going to get these patients off of these pills? What are we going to do differently? What are you going to do differently to make a difference in your condition? Right. We don't talk about it that way. We have that 15 minute visit and out of which I have maybe seven minutes that the patient has to, to doctors don't even get to touch the patient anymore. <laughs> Mostly the nurses. Even that. They don't even have a chance to talk to the doctors. Healthcare has changed. And that's what's happened right now with telehealth. They're actually getting to spend time talking to their doctors like this, not distracted, not actually being able to have a conversation. And the other thing that's really important is that cannabis, the patient learns how to use it. They're able to learn. You teach a child to brush their teeth twice a day. And in adulthood, they hopefully learn to continue to do those things. Yeah, it gives them a sense of ownership in their own health. That's good. That's good. <laughs> so the way forward with cannabis, um, since there is that sense of ownership on the patient, you know, as they kind of progress in their journey and their development of their regimen through, you know, walking with the doctor, um, the grow your own argument 
Do you think that that is going to be something that a lot of patients will start to do in the future? Or do you think that they'll still have to or want to rely on the physician to give them their advice? Well, you bring up two things. So one thing is growing your own, which is something that some patients are sassy and they love it. You know, I got (laughs) grannies that are gardeners, right? That now this is just another little plant in their garden and they're growing it and they're baking, they're creating and they're making stuff with it and they're unbelievable between knitting, they're trimming, okay? And this is one (laughs) group of patients, seriously. And um, then we've got people that should not be growing, should not have anything to do with growing because they don't know what the frick they're doing and they don't have the space or they don't have even that as an option. So I feel people should have that as an option it's like your tomatoes. You should be able to grow your, your cannabis. It's up to you. Um, as far as the medical aspects of this, I absolutely support the cannabis should be always medical. And I'll explain to you why. If you are able to buy ibuprofen over the counter, any, anybody can go buy ibuprofen right now. Anybody can go buy aspirin. But if you needed a stronger dose of that medicine, you need a prescription for it, okay? So there's variations. So it's like being able to get something over the counter at a lower dose or a higher concentration that you need guidance to go through a pharmacist or through a prescription. So that's how I look at how things might be able to be delivered to people. One set of but both people need to understand that if you take ibuprofen, you could bleed to death. It right. can cause gastritis. You know, it can cause high blood pressure. These are the things, the consequences of this medicine must be taught. Oh yeah, so ibuprofen's terrible. <laughs> we just lost my uncle two weeks ago who had a head injury, fell after a head injury, took aspirin, ibuprofen, and a Tylenol for a headache, and bled to death. Oh, no. So when you talk about these are meds that are available over the counter to anybody pretty much all over the world, and they can kill you, but I can boldly say my plant, cannabis, you can't overdose from it. You may feel like you're dying, (laughs) but you ain't going to die from it. And that is a fact. Right. And these are the facts that we need people to understand right now. That, yes, this is the virus. We're going to overcome this. We're going to get back into our mode. We're going to make some changes. But you've got to take your ownership of your health. You've got to start taking accountability. I call it the ABCDEs of life. Once you're aware of something, please hold yourself accountable. B, you always want to be better or the best. So we have to develop behaviors. C, we have a choice. And our choice is cannabis. And we want people to get committed to it instead of being on a pharmaceutical drug or using something that can harm you. D, people are determined by the time they get to me or they're looking for this information. I'm a pain in the ass. (laughs) And I discipline my patients. I discipline them to make them understand that this is about understanding that it's you've got to do this. We educate them. And I'm proud of that. All of my patients (laughs) know about the endocannabinoid system. I can't say that about all of my colleagues yet. But they understand by getting educated, they're empowered. And that's a work in progress and at the end of the day we're all going to rest in peace and in between it i want them to live life hey that's a good way to go about it because like you said you have to start at the basic level and to understand that how this quote-unquote drug uh you know that everyone calls cannabis um, is going to interact with your body because there's a lot of side effects with the pharmaceuticals and there's hardly any that could possibly happen. You know, there's the, the rare few, depending on the certain, you know, the individual and their pre-existing conditions, et cetera. 
um, that, you know, could have a, a bad interaction, but also, uh, which brings up a good point. What, um, what prescriptions or what medications have you seen that interact bad with cannabis or hemp? Let's talk about that because everything does have interactive properties. Okay. And right now, people have gotten on board with CBD and people don't understand that even with CBD, CBD is in three forms. It could be synthetic, which is made in a laboratory. It could be hemp derived or from the marijuana plant. And cannabis, when ingested, is metabolized in the liver. So there's a system known as the cytochrome P450. And I don't want to go into more details other than saying that this system is a very important factor in how multiple drugs, multiple foods are metabolized in our system. So this is why they'll tell you, don't mix grapefruit juice with this medicine. Don't go out in the sunlight if you do this medicine. There's interactions that we look at regardless based on certain medications. And you must do that as well with cannabis. And everybody's different. <laughs> you might be that one person where this interacts with you in a different way. And it's the combination. It's your genetic combin factors. It's the medications that you're on, all of it together, and how it's not being broken down or too much is being built up. And this is where it's about a system. And the endocannabinoid system is also that it can be upregulated, it can be downregulated. And it is also a perfect segue into why we're saying how endocannabinoid deficiencies are related to so many illnesses. We're understanding migraines, fibromyalgia, IBS, MS, so many diseases by just giving cannabis as a supplementation is able to alleviate and even decrease their symptoms of those diseases. Now, is that going to be the acidic form or the CBDA or the CBD? Or are you guys doing research in both of those or one more particular? I have a big smile on my face because now you're talking about the plant in its different forms, mm -hmm. right? So when we talk about the plant, when you have it grown, it's in its acidic form, okay? And there's a conversion. Mm -hmm. If you heat it at a certain temperature, you have to get it to where it goes from CBDA to CBD, from THCA to THC. So, and this is where we're learning much more about why inhalation, methods of inhalation are quick onset. Edibles, it gets converted from 9 delta to 11 hydroxy. It's a chemical reaction that happens in the liver, which makes it a much more potent and a longer lasting chemical. So this is where we're understanding people can get the raw form of the plant and get certain types of cannabinoids. They can heat it at a low temperature and get certain cannabinoids. They can even combust it and have a certain level of cannabinoids. But people are going sometimes to the intermediate where they're vaporizing it vaporizing the flour, vaporizing liquids, vaporizing concentrates. That's one medium of getting it into your body. And what we're realizing is that some people will even start out with something as simple as a topical. They have no effects intoxicating or otherwise, but there's receptors. The skin is the largest organ system and they can apply things topically to it and get effects. So you're saying that people can consume THC through the skin? Absolutely, because we've got receptors on our skin as well. So let's talk about receptors. So the first receptor that was identified was CB1, which is primarily in the brain. CB2, which is primarily in the immune system. But these receptors are throughout our body. And <laughs> that's why one plant is working for so many different ailments. And this is why the skin, um, under the tongue, belly button, rectal, vaginal, all of these 
are delivery mechanisms of how cannabis can be delivered to individuals and the bioavailability of it varies depending on the delivery system. And speaking of delivery systems, which one have you guys found to be more effective or more efficient? It depends on the individual. So if you're talking about somebody with nausea, okay, when you're feeling nauseous, if you take a pill and, um, oops, <laughs> I'm sorry. If you take a pill and you throw it up, now you, it's, it hasn't defe it defeated the whole purpose. But if you could put it in as a suppository or if somebody's seizing, the mouth and the anus are very quick acting delivery systems. So if you were to lift your tongue up and look, there's a lot of blood vessels. So tinctures are a great method for people to start out with too because they can start with five drops under the tongue and hold it there for 10 seconds, 20 seconds, 30 seconds, up to even a minute. And then they could swallow it. So they get a twofold effect. They get the acute effect and then the later onset effect as well. And it is, it's fascinating because we've taught our patients that will come in and they'll say, oh, Dr. Uma, I don't want to smoke it and I don't want to be high. That's the most common comments that I'll hear. And I'll be like, well, okay, fine. <laughs> you don't have to smoke it and you don't have to be high. You know, you don't have to feel like you're impaired. And if you do feel like you're impaired, we can offset it. Take a little CBD, take a peppercorn, take a vitamin C. Time, time, you'll be fine. Right. You know, eat something, go lay down, relax. You're not going to die. <laughs> but these are the things that people have to be taught that you got to wait. If you inhale, it's short acting. But if you ingest, and especially with some of these amazing edibles, they're, <laughs> they're so yummy, you know, mm -hmm. and people just get overwhelmed and don't understand that when they say that this cookie is 50 milligrams, and if you eat the whole cookie, that means you're consuming 50 milligrams is not what you start with. Right. <laughs> you know, so this is where understanding that you still have to be educated and you have to understand, you have to take precautions. And you have to understand that every time you're not going to get the same effect. Right. And so this is where um, trial and error is part of understanding that it is going to be a little bit of experience that will tell you. It's like kids. If you have more than one child, you know that both kids do not behave the same way to eating the same foods. Right. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> you know, and thank God that they don't behave the same way, even though that they came from the same parents. You know, this is where uh, my analogy is. I think of cannabis, and I talk about it, in serving sizes versus dosing it. Because if people understand that, you know, a cup is a cup is a cup is a cup. But if I gave you a cup and I have a cup, the cup is gonna be the same measurement. But if you filled it up with some grapes and you counted the number of grapes you had and you said, Dr. Emma, I got 12 grapes in mine and I count how many I have and I go, well, I got only eight. It's not that the cup is different. It's that the size of the grapes are different. That's a good point. That's, so yeah. this, is, this is why we have to make people understand that why is cannabis not always the same? And they'll look at the label and the concentration. The candy bar will look identical every time because it's a mold. Mm -hmm. But it's not going to be the same amount in each dose as they take it. It's mostly just a mathematical equation, would you say? That's correct. People when can't it... add, hon. People can't <laughs> add right now. And we're going to make them do mathematical equations. And especially <laughs> if they're in pain. And uh, no, it ain't happening. And this is why I tell people low and slow and titrate. Titrate. It's the, it's the chemical engineer's daughter in me, you know, because <laughs> my dad always, you know, back in chemistry class, one drop. And it would be that one drop that would change it to that college date. One too much would change it back. One too little wasn't there. And yeah. Back. Mm -hmm. And so what we're letting people understand is that you 
have control over your illnesses and you can make some changes. And right now we want people to always understand the value of hydrating. Make sure they add a little lemon, lime, a couple drops apple cider vinegar, alkalize it, green tea, ginger water, all of these different things that you can consume. Vitamins, vitamin A, vitamin B, vitamin C, vitamin D, and zinc. These are the five supplements that I'm telling people to be aware of and make sure you get them, either through your foods or sunlight. Some way you should be able to get these things into your life. Get your exercises in you. Walk, do some squats, do some leg lifts. Anything that you can do because you've got to keep your joints and your mobility going. Use it or lose it. <laughs> this is the bottom line of it, right? Yep. And that's the other thing that we're starting to see with our patients. As they have a little bit better quality of life, they start moving. As they start to move, then they are able to lose weight. They're also conscious of what they're putting in their body. They've got mobility. They've got motility. So they're peeing and pooping. <laughs> and then they start to get a little sassy. They get a little sexual activity in their lives. What a concept. So this is where we're not here just pushing one thing. I am here telling people you have a body and you have a system that most people know little to nothing about. And I describe the endocannabinoid system in one word, life. And they didn't teach it to me. And my mission is to make sure we learn about it. We understand that how there are options and there's much more to learn, not just about the cannabis plant, many more things that we need to learn about. And we don't have the answers. And what we do know and the truth that we do know, we must share. Well said. <laughs> and you bring up a very good point calling the endocannabinoid system life because I think the main point, if you really want to get down to it, at brass tax level, the main thing that cannabis and hemp has taught the masses across the globe is that the entourage effect that cannabis has taught us is relevant in so many different topics in life. Just like you said, they're raising a family, going to work, going to school, whatever. The entourage of that, the entourage of medicine, sleep, exercise, water, the entourage effect of that. Everybody's starting to become aware of the entourage effect and the entourage effect hopefully will you know spread through love throughout humanity. And I'm glad that you were able to come on the show today and talk to us about all of the wisdom that you have. And I'm sure that you're just barely hitting the iceberg on all of this. We would love to have you back on again. Can't wait for it. I was really excited to have you on today. I got educated. Thank you for educating me more because there were some things where I might have misspoke on some things. And, you know, to hear it from a medical professional who's been doing it for so long, who's actually in the trenches, it's, it's good to hear, you know, and it's good to get this message out to share the message of, you know, the wonderful plant that is hemp and cannabis. But all the, you know, at the end of the day, it's cannabis sativa, like you said. And I just want to leave you with what I call, I say the plant, cannabis, the plant. In the Ayurvedic history, this plant was known as a sacred plant. And what they said lived in it was a guardian angel, which helped us with fear and anxiety. And what I say that this plant is for is for people, it's for pets, it's for the planet, it's for peace, and it's for profit, and it's the plant. <laughs> oh, awesome. This, thank you again, uh, Dr. Uma. Um, thank how, you, Lance. How can the people that are listening follow your journey? Uh, LinkedIn, what, uh, do you have a publication that you put out? Um, how, how can they get a hold of you or follow your journey? Our website is upliftinghealthandwellness.com. And uh, that's the email as well, upliftinghealthandwellness at gmail.com. And our uh, website is under construction, so we'll be able to be able to tell you where we're going to be um, once this is all lifted. I speak all over the world. I love to speak wherever I can. So if you would like me to come and speak at your venue, please contact us. And um, we are on Twitter. We're on Facebook and um, Instagram. And we can, and our website page will have that information as well. Perfect. And I'll get all those links and tags and uh, usernames and whatever. And we'll put those below in the description uh, whenever we post it on YouTube. And one of my quotes that has been used is cannabis is not an entrance drug. It is an exit drug from pharmaceuticals, narcotics, 
alcohol and nicotine. Awesome. <laughs> we'll definitely post that one as well. I'm going to start using that one. <laughs> God bless me. Use it well. Thank all right. you again, Lance, for this time. And I really appreciate all the work that you're doing because as we educate, I always say, reach one, teach 10, teach one, reach 10. So spread the word, whatever information that you learn. God bless Thank and be well. Thank you, doctor. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.